Hey y'all, you know what December is. I mean, it is the holiday season, but it's also when Feminist Frequency has our annual end of year campaign, which allows you all to help us keep making all of this great work that we're doing. From the Games and Online Harassment Hotline that provides emotional support for people who make and play games, to a training that we're building with Take This for the games industry to help end abuse and toxicity in workplaces and empower workplaces to be better and safer for all of their employees, to all of the podcasts that we are working on. And uh, hey, little, little side note, we are working on a new one that I'm really excited about. So if you want to help us keep making all of this work, doing all of this work, helping all of the people that we support through all of our programming, please consider kicking in a few bucks to our end of year campaign. You can visit givebutter.com slash femfreak2021. That's givebutter.com slash femfreak2021. The, the fact that, as you say, like there's, you know, here it's it, there it's it, everywhere it's it, it in this film. <laughs> Welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love. I'm Anita Sarkeesian, and I've spent the last couple of weeks negotiating a dowry for Ebony Adams. But you know what? Her dad's not paying up. He absolutely wouldn't. He would be like, listen, you take her or you don't. (laughs) (laughs) On today's episode, we have got two wonderful things in store, a surprise guest and a discussion about Paul Verhoeven's absolutely bonkers new movie, Benedetta. Stay tuned. a choisi notre bienheureuse sœur, Benedetta. Santa Benedetta. Benedetta. Hey, Ebony. Hey, Anita. Do you know why I'm so excited? Is it the same reason I'm so excited? Yes. I bet it is. Uh, (laughs) We have a very special guest to round out this season of Feminist Frequency Radio, Carolyn Pettit. What? What? She's here? Yes! Wow, wow, I've always wanted to meet her. Uh, yes. We have missed you so much, Carolyn. We really have. Well, I've missed podcasting with y'all, too. And- Girls, quit lying. You, I know you wake up every week and you're like, uh, they- another week not recording the podcast. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's a little tough to fit into my busy schedule on the regular. That's true. I do work at... Oh, Carolyn's at- busy schedule. I'm taking meetings, on- going to New I- York Fashion Week, going Going to yes. expensive restaurants. That, oh, sure. All I the wish. movie premieres. Oh, mm-hmm. I wish. Although I, I did go to the the North American premiere of this film that we're talking about today, and I'll share a little bit of what that was like when we get to the meet it when we get to the Do movie it. discussion. Yeah. But, okay. Um, well, well, yeah. Okay. But yeah. How, how's your life, Carol? Yeah, it's good. I'm I'm in New York City now. You know, I, I have a new job. I'm managing editor at. Uh, a website called Kotaku. You know, we cover video games, as most of our listeners probably know. Um, I'm really proud of the work that we do covering things like the uh, the current um, just uh, labor and workplace uh, mm-hmm. issues that, you know, I guess particularly maybe at Activision Blizzard, but, um, it, you know, throughout the industry, I think we do really good work um, uh covering that and you know but also just uh i think we do really interesting criticism i think we talk about games and games culture in interesting ways and i'm thrilled to be a part of it so i'm also thrilled to be here in a new city i mean i love the bay area but i had been there for a long time and it was good uh a good opportunity for me to um you know shake things up in my life a bit and really important question yes how are you dealing with the weather oh i not it's not so bad i mean not yet anyway <laughs> knock on wood um i mean i've bought you know i've definitely had to buy some warmer jackets and scarves and caps and gloves and things but uh, so far, it's, uh, you know, it, it, at least I, I may get tired of it eventually. But right now, you know, I mean, it's kind of invigorating to have 
uh, to experience seasons in a way that you don't in the Bay Area. I mean, I saw yeah. snow uh, recently and it was pretty exciting because I, I hadn't seen snow in such a long time. So, you know, for, I'm trying to enjoy that aspect. And thus far, I, I'm kind, I kind of am enjoying that aspect of it, of being here. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. 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 Well, my joy for your new life outweighs my missing you on the podcast. Aww, <laughs> Mine doesn't thank you. come back. Thank you. I know. I'm just, I'm, you know, they say to write positive affirmations or whatever, like lie to uh. yourself until it's true. That's what <laughs> I was just trying to do. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Okay, hold I'm on. We're going to pause. Trying- yeah. Mm. Ho- hold on. Um, Carolyn, are you recording on a separate audio than what we're hearing? I'm recording on my Zoom audio. Yeah. Okay, great. Just because there's, um, I'm hearing some mic ruffling. So as long as that's not oh. on the audio recording, it's Oh, fine. right. Yeah, that mic. Sorry, but that's just what my headphones probably that's okay. that I'm, yeah. So. It, it's not annoying enough for us. I just, okay. for the podcast, I wanted to just make sure that wasn't the podcast audio. Of course. Of okay. course. So, um, Ebony, were you going to say something? Uh, whatever it was, it didn't, it's doesn't matter. Let's okay. get into Benedetta. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, Carol, do you want to tell us your experience before we like do our little boring intro of the movie? No, no, I don't know. Let's do, let's set okay. up the movie first and then okay. I will talk about it. All right, Ebony, why, why don't you tell us a little bit about what we're about to talk about? <laughs> There's no way I can <laughs> adequately prepare listeners who have not viewed this movie. I will say I spent three quarters of the movie going did Uma Thurman and Jodie Comer have a baby? Because Benedetta looks just like both of them. Anyway, here at Feminist Frequency Radio, we will never knowingly pass up an opportunity to see Charlotte Rampling and a Wimple. We make that vow to you. <laughs> that is why we chose to mortify our flesh with the latest offering from director and co-writer Paul Verhoeven. Also, when we asked Carolyn to come back and be a guest on the pod, we knew we had to make it worth her cinematic while. So, Caro, I know you were like... Listen, don't give me the easy stuff. Bring me the hard stuff. I want to get into it. I want to, you know, flex my my muscles here. You don't <laughs> have Thomas Keller swing by and give an opinion on canned soup. You don't ask Vera Wang to sew a oh, button on your okay. radial cardigan. And you don't ask Carol oh. to come back and talk about anything but a very Carol movie. Okay. Long searching oh, this looks. Is not a want- very, <laughs> this is not a very Carol movie. I'm sorry. Just to All be right, clear. So, just to be clear. We're going to get into that. So yeah. Benedetta is the story of a fervently devoted 17th century Italian nun who is consumed by the force of her transcendent visions and the illicit attraction she shares with another woman in the convent. The vibrancy of Sister Benedetta's inner life is matched by the insistent reality of the world and the body. The film offers a buffet of bodily sights, sounds, and smells that exude from the screen. It is both shockingly carnal and seductively beatific, and it owes as much to films like The Seventh Seal as it does to Suspiria. Let's get into it. I just watched this. Uh, so it is a very like, fresh, like right well, now. Before it we is, it, it is right out of the ebony <laughs> oven. It's, it, it, <laughs> it's hot and I, ready. But I know Carol, you watched it like a couple of months ago, right? Yeah. Because you're fancy and glamorous now. You went to the premiere. So I'm, I'm glad that it's so vivid in your memory because unfortunately, it has faded a bit in mine. So the, what I went to was not, not like a gala premiere. There were no celebrities there. It was, it, but. It was shown at the New York Film Festival, which happened to be taking place basically like not long after I arrived in New York. And somebody just happened to invite me. You know, they had tickets and they were like, we have an extra one. Somebody dropped out of our group. Do you want to come? And I said, sure. And so and, you know, I'm I'm very interested in Paul Verhoeven's films. I mean, I think he's certainly a very interesting and vital filmmaker. And, uh, you know, so yes, of course, I was not going to pass up the opportunity. But what was fascinating about that experience of going to see the film there was that there were a a small but very, you know, vocal and attention getting group of Catholic protesters outside (laughs) Uh of the film. And so they had signs like and I took it. I'm looking at my own tweets from that day to remind myself. So, for instance, they had this banner that read, 
we vehemently protest the blasphemous lesbian movie Benedetta that insults the sanctity of Catholic nuns. And <laughs> well, I mean, and I so, had the same sign when I went to go see Dune. I vehemently <laughs> protest <laughs> this film about lesbian space nuns. So, um, so I get it. So, I mean, I, you know, it's like I, I, I did not love this film. I will, you mm-hmm. know, I'll just say that like we can get into it more. However, you know, the fact that it, just the fact almost that it 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 uh, provoked it, this group, you know, to come out and protest did sway my sympathies m- more in its favor because I want to piss off these people, too. And because I think, <laughs> the, I think the things that I object to in it are different from the things that they object to in it. Like, I think what right. they object to in it is just like, well, it's the se- sexual it's it's it's. I mean, it's obviously it's the homosexuality specifically, the queerness, Mm -hmm. but it's just even the portrayal of people of faith, you know, people in, you know, nuns or clergy um, being like full blooded, like sexual, like complex human beings who experience lust and, you know, desire and all of these things. And it's like, you know, there's uh, obviously in cinema, I mean, uh, I w- want, I mean, to me, there's nothing that, you know, humanizes, that makes faith more interesting, that more illuminating than being honest about the fact that people of faith also, you know, experience desire and uh, pleasure and, uh, you know, all of th- these things. I mean, like... So I mean, uh, what they should be mad about is is not the queerness. They should be mad about the fact that like this whole movie is just a condemnation of the hypocrisy of the religion, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, sure. I think like that's, <laughs> right? that's like, <laughs> the, the film, I think, um, tries to walk a line. And to my mind, it's fairly successful in suggesting that there is a difference between um, sort of sincere spiritual yearning versus the very worldly um, desires of the church, you know, like the institution of the church. And so you have like that great scene with when we first meet um, the nuncio played by Merovingian Lambert Wilson, you know, in that fantastic purple robe, right? And this just like voluptuary of a servant who comes in to serve him and, you know, flashes her boob at the scandalized former abbess. Right. So I think like the film has, has very little patience for the manipulations and the machinations of the church. At no point yes. do we feel as if the words coming out of like, the men in power um, are sincere, are, are driven by anything other than their desire to advance further to achieve what they want to achieve as men in the world. And they will use anything that it takes, whether it's, you know, um, the, the visions of Benedetta, whether it is, you know, the, the labor of these, um, these community of nuns, you know, like anything and everything uh, will, will be put to you. So, yeah, I think the film is is very clear, (laughs) you know, like the church is the, Yes. It's full of shit. It's full uh, of shit. Uh, absolutely. And I I do love that about it. And also, so, yes, you know, to Anita's point, this is not a very Caro movie. And I would say it's not a very Caro movie, for, you know, um, for, you know, one reason why is that it is amped up to 11. It is a, mm-hmm. you know, Verhoeven. It, it is, also, it took place on more than one day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sh- shut up. It's, but it's a film. I find it a film of great, like, appetite, sensual. Like, you yeah. feel Verhoeven's sensual and sexual appetites okay. on every level I, tw- through the through the film. And, mm-hmm. and no, I'm serious here. I mean, I, I know you are. And, I'm, I'm- and you know, I... I I I can I really uh, like I can enjoy that to a point, but I'm I, but the films that I really gravitate to do tend to be a little more m- like uh, have more of a l- low key kind of <laughs> rhythm to them. So you're you telling mean, me they that don't you involve. Didn't... Sorry, go ahead. But <laughs> just like, if someone had said this was a film directed by 
um, Paul Greenaway, you wouldn't have been surprised. Is that what you're telling me, Carol? <laughs> I, I haven't seen enough Greenaway to speak to that. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but um, oh you know, god, like, rival rival film nerds. Y- Here yes. we go. But um, you know, I, I I think that like the sex scenes in this film, I think are fascinating. Were fascinating to me because of how how much the ecstasy of them did mm-hmm. seem both kind of, you know, physical, carnal, and in a sense, kind of spiritual, right? Mm-hmm. I think there is a spiritual quality to them. And and yet, like, although what I, I guess one thing that I, I find really interesting and complicated about this film is that although Benedetta is positioned as like this force that could um, undo, you know, the church's power to some degree, um, I found her very evil in her own way. Like, I think, you know, I'm watching Succession right now, right? And, and like, that's a show in which, like, everyone is just terrible. Everyone's awful, in my opinion. I, you know, although I, I think Benedetta in this film is, is she's not somebody, like, I, I, I sort of root for her because I want her to to undermine the abusive, you know, oppressive use of authority and power as the church wields it. But I think that she gets very drunk on her own power as well. And like, like you can see when she's able to like deliver a comeuppance to somebody who has done her wrong, like how, how just, she just seems to kind of revel in it in this way that is like, I found kind of ghastly too. Yeah. So you know, I, yeah. I I think it's it's interesting that the film does not, at least for me, uh, she is no uh, she's use she's you know using what power she finds through manipulation and mm-hmm. deceit and maybe even her own delusion. Like maybe she believes that you know she, Jesus, that like all her her amazing spectacular visions of Jesus as action hero, right? <laughs> um, mm-hmm. I mean. Like, but but it's still a delusion. I mean, it, as far as so, I'm concerned. Okay, so, so. I want to come back to this, but yeah. I, w- I want to, I, I just, I need to come in with my heavy handed, yeah, sure. uh, absurd uh, analysis of things, which sure. is, I like, if I, I think it's probably safe to assume that Verhoeven has had sex in his life and, you know, married, mm-hmm. whatever. If there's uh, anything but, I didn't want to con- contemplate. But the reason I say this is because I would describe this movie as a 12 year old boy who yes. has never had sex before and like li- is living out all of their titty fantasies mm-hmm. in one big go. Like some people are arguing that this is um, like exploitation, which is you know <laughs> fair, I guess. But to me, it was like this weird mixing of like trying to see things from like a female, like sexuality perspective, but was so aggressively male gaze that I was like, Oh my God, like every single moment that you could see a tit, any single moment that like you wouldn't be expecting to see a boob one just fucking pops out. Like, you know, and like (laughs) one, there's a scene where there's a woman who's like, who's pregnant and she just like squirts her fucking milk out of her boob for no reason. There's another scene where another woman's like boob is like, it's rotted. And so it's an excuse so that we can see ban up ban at a holy shit. (laughs) Benedetta (laughs) Benedetta looking at her boob. Like there's another, Uh, there's another scene where she's like, I had a vision where Jesus replaced my heart with a bigger heart and it's too big. Touch my boob. <laughs> yes. like, mm-hmm. I mean, oh my I, God. Like, I, I think that the, 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 the woman, the, the, who squirts milk from her breast, that's part of, that's part, that's partially illustrating again, the, the kind of hypocrisy of the church, the, yeah. because that's, the, you know, that's yes, the, I, the I, totally. lustful, but you know, I, but I mean, yes. I, I the, walked out of the movie going, so, so I walked to the movie with two things. One mm. was it was sensationalist with no real value to the sensationalism to mm. some degree. Like, mm. I think that it 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 could have been more intentional in how it did it instead of just being like boobs, boobs, boobs. Let's all look at boobs. Um, but the other thing yeah. is I did actually walk out of the movie going, why was this made? What was the point? Which I was disappointed by because I do think that despite like 
you know, Verhoeven's not my favorite director by any means, but I think sure. that he has a perspective and I yes. think that he has something to say and it's clear what he's saying. And in this, I was like, what? I Like, I guess you're saying the church is hypocritical. Like it just, it felt so meandery and like, um, and just kind of like, why did you make this? And that's a I, really weird feeling to walk out of a movie with. I, I enjoyed the movie. And that's because when I surrender to Paul Verhoeven's um, insistent lack of subtlety, I have yeah. a great time. You know, I, I, right. I really do have a great time. And I think, you know, so there's there are the themes, you know, that Verhoeven is playing with um, and the various techniques that he uses to try and express something in the film. But I mean, they're they're like if you take all of that away, I do think the film is luscious to look at. I mean, the way that the cinematographer like plays with light and colors um, is so deliberate in this film. I mean, like I'm thinking about the scene where um, Bened- she's an adult now, and I think her her parents have come back to the convent for something. I can't remember what. But anyways, there's a feast, right? And there's this shot of grapes on the table, and just like the vivid purple of those grapes, or you know the the crimson of blood. Sometimes, like I just thought it was an exquisite movie to to look at in a lot of ways. And I did laugh at the way that Verhoeven, you know, sort of he refuses to allow you to not recognize the body in this, you know? And I mean, you can call it like heavy handed, which it absolutely is. But I think, you know, in another director's hands, this film would have been so much in the mind. It would have been this very sort of like contemplative, um, sort of, you know, like psychic exploration of faith and power and desire. But Paul Rohoven is like, no, this is a this is a human story and it, I'm situating it in the bodily the body and like bodily appetites. Well, that's you know? really convenient. And so that, like, but it's convenient that it's being done in the bo- in these very particular bodies. Sure. Oh, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And I mean, like the the fact that, as you say, like there's, you know, here a tit, there it's it, everywhere a tit tit in this film. <laughs> like, absolutely. And it's it's of course, like the metaphor of like, you know, breasts being the signifier of motherhood. And, you know, the feminine and the divine feminine. Yes, absolutely. He picks with a very, very, like, dark, deep, broad brush with that. Um, But as I said, like, when I just sort of recognized that everything was going to be underlined, it was, you know, it was like an illuminated script of its own, you know, there's going to be bold print. Um, I was like, yeah, I'm 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 in for the why for the ride of this sexy nun movie. And by the way, the thing that did bother me the most is the fact that Bartolomeo, who is um, like Benedetta's sort of like teacher in the sensual arts, right? I have a real problem with the fact that Bartolomeo is the person who introduces her to this and is in her way um, like the primary driver of that, at least initially, knowing her history, knowing that she has been sexually assaulted and abused so horrifically by her father and her brothers and, you know, abused by like the society at large, right? As a, as a woman in poverty in this period. And so to have her be like that sort of sexual driver um, and initiate Benedetta into those central delays had a real problem. With. Well, also remember like she assaulted Benedetta several times and yeah. it was, and it was like, not called out that it was assault, right? Like we, I don't think we are supposed to think the word assault in those situations. It feels a lot like the, like the no, 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 yes kind of deal where it's like, Mm -hmm. I'm just going to keep trying until she says yes. And now she's saying yes. So it was okay that I did these things, but she really actually wanted it. Um, Which is usually done in like by men, like a hetero sort of situation. And here, you know, it's, it's a man's vision (laughs) bringing this to life. So there's a lot of that in here. And but I don't think like I'm not like, oh, how dare you do that? I think, hey, harm begets harm. So there's an interesting thing here about the fact that she was assaulted and that's Mm -hmm. how she shows affection. But that was completely not on the table in terms of the discussion. And Mm -hmm. I think this is also related to what I wanted to circle back to what Carolyn was saying 
is how Benedetta is a villain in this in a lot of ways. And I Mm -hmm. was really frustrated that the lesbians were the villains, right? Mm -hmm. In this particular story, right? I I mean, I think the church is the biggest villain uh, by far. I don't think so. Oh, I, I, yeah, I, Like, I, I, yes, like, yes, but also you have the, um, the ma the mama <laughs> I don't remember yeah, the reverend mother yeah the reverend mother sure. um and like her daughter who are the ones who are like no we are actually true believers she's fucking lying um and but so so yeah. t- so it's not like i don't know like there's still some goodness the church could still be good if you didn't have all of these corrupted people but it, like that's kind of what i got out of it mm-hmm. is like there's all these people in power who are creating corruption and benedetta it, creating who are corrupt and benedetta is trying to get a hold of that now i i just think it's a problem when the two lesbians the two queer people in the movie are the bad ones like you don't really have sympathy for benedetta at some point and Bar- bartolomea ends up being like Ultimately, her character didn't mean anything because she just gets like brushed aside and is kind of useless, right? Like she is just a prop for Benedetta to like get her rocks I, off. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, it's 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 tough with a film like this because I think that I mean, I do think that the sensory experience of it all is to some degree kind of the you know, becomes kind of the point or like, Mm -hmm. like it's more about feeling the intensity of life. And I think this is a film in which, in which, you know, uh, to Ebony's point, like the aesthetics and just the, the, of everything uh, matter. And I think what Verhoeven is trying to do at at times, just, just aesthetically and thematically, and just with the intensity of the whole film is, is kind of contrast like beauty and rot right with the plague and right. everything and yeah. and kind of communicate how but this is all part of life like there you know you cannot completely separate the one from the other like there it's all intertwined and it's all so much you know more intense and immediate and beautiful and ugly than the church can can even I like mean, i it, clearly it, don't have a subtle enough analysis no no i mean i'm not, I'm not like i know no, because, no, because i also want to say like see I, I mean i'm wary of making these those kind you know i've become increasingly wary of making the kinds of criticisms of like um oh you know where saying that say, something just feels very like Mm, male you know in its in its Mm, whatever mm. its perspective because i i sometimes you know i will see tweets that say well that's like a really kind of essentialist criticism like like for instance there was recently and not to start a whole separate discussion but like the film the last duel which i haven't seen right Mm -hmm. but there were some discourse around the last duel that was like well it's like ridley scott just doing such and such you know in this very like male oriented way and then there were these female critics like you know it, like established female critics with a, with a deep history and knowledge and love of film who were kind of like fuck you i i, lo- I love that movie and i think what you're saying mm-hmm. about it is completely like dismissive of you would know you, my experience of it so would you I, feel but, differently but, well, hold on would I, you feel differently if we if i articulated it more as like a patriarchal perspective well no, that creates I'm, it more systemically so, well well what i'm leading up to saying though mm-hmm. it, first of all is that i you know as reluctant as i am to say it like yeah, so the the co-writer of this film, right, w- 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 did speak a little bit before the screening that I was at. And and you know, so that colored my perspective of the film a little bit, and I did kind of feel like, oh, this is just like two dudes per- <laughs> per- perving out a little bit. Like they just, <laughs> you know, um and so I did. So I like I'm sort of saying that I that I I mean, I agree with you at the same time. Like, I do feel like this is very like it. there is a juvenile quality to it that I think is, yes, let's say patriarchal um, in its which outlook. which here's the but, thing is in, in RoboCop or Starship Troopers, <laughs> uh-huh. the, juve, the juvenileness is what gives the. I, I wouldn't have even called it juvenile, but if I'm like kind of dry, trying to draw a comparison is like what gives it that kind of weird edge that I think is sure. so distinctive and interesting. Sure, sure. The problem is when you attach it to sexuality, uh, that opens up a whole new perspective for me that I think is more damaging and more harmful. 
in yeah, this I mean, context, right? Like you and I, you know, disagree on readings of Starship Troopers because it's the one yeah. Verhoeven yeah. film where I'm just like, you have failed so radically to achieve <laughs> what you set out to achieve. And I recognize that Mary Robinette Kowal, you and I, you know the real, <laughs> right? Yeah, but yeah. but most, but but I I think yeah, like I totally get what you were saying um, about the. <laughs> the sort of soft focus, yeah. languid, you know, um, ethereally beautiful, you know, skinny white women, you know, touching each other <laughs> and whatever kind of like sexy times of this film seems very like, you know, um, Cinemax kind of, <laughs> you yeah, know, skin, level. Skinemax. Skinemax. Exactly. You know, like I, I totally get it. <laughs> but because to me, so much of the the life of the women in the convent mirrored this kind of um boy, this this fascination with the way that all female environments can horrify and bewitch men like in, you know, I mentioned Suspiria in the introduction, but just this kind of like seventies horror kind of way. It worked for me because the whole thing was so uh, hyperbolic. And yeah. it's, you know, you know what like none of it was in, the, none of it was in the realm of the real. And so yeah. the fact that those sex seems, you know, seems ludicrous in their way did not affect me. But I totally get what you're saying, Anita, that it was like, oh, Jesus, this is like a 14 year old getting like, you know, just perving I, out. I mean, it, it, there's a way in which it reminds me a little bit of Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula film in terms Ooh, of it's like yeah. uh, over the top, just energy and sensuality and. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's a film. Uh, so in that film, like you have Anthony Hopkins as uh, Van Helsing, right? And he mm-hmm. is he himself is a character of such appetite for life. So such, such lustful mm-hmm. like and I'm lustful. I don't mean just sexually. I mean, just like he has a lust for life uh, in every sense. He loves to he loves wine and food. And he just you know, he is like the embodiment of life, I guess, contrasted with like Dracula's sort of being this embodiment of of death and rot and what have you. And there's just this over the top, again, quality and energy to, to that whole film. And that becomes the energy itself is, it becomes like the point and the, almost the experience of of watching it as you get carried away. And uh, while I certainly think Dracula is a superior film uh, um, and a, a, and a film that was maligned and misunderstood and underrated at the time of its release, um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like so, anyway, that's, that was just an association that I mm-hmm. had here where that, mm-hmm. that's it's that energy and that, that there's just, I mean, as, as much as like, I came out of this film a little like exhausted and a little like, okay, for hope and like, take it down a notch, like, oh, uh-huh. um, I also like, I, I mean, I'm also like glad, you know, I am glad that this, that this film exists and that he is a a filmmaker who does just go for it. And, (laughs) and, um, I can live without this film existing in the world. (laughs) Sure. Sure. (laughs) Understood. Understood. Mm. One thing I was thinking about in the end is Mm. like, so you see her visions of, of Jesus. Um, and and then you stop. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. The action heroes, Jesus. Yeah. Um, and then as soon as she does the, what's it called again? The hand, the stigmata. Stigmata. The stigmata. Yeah. Um, and as soon as you see the one where like there's a question about the fact that she if she whether she carves her forehead or not, right? Mm. If she like what well, is fulfilling the prophecy mm-hmm. or, you know, whatever the vision, the whatever the church needs to validate the fact that she really is like the second coming of Jesus or whatever. Um then you stop seeing visions. You stop seeing her visions. She talks about them, but you don't see them anymore. Right. Um, and so they it 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 brings up this question of like, is she lying? Is she making this up? And I liked that, like that. You know, you're like she is obviously, but also maybe not. Like maybe she believes it. Like you still oh, yeah. there's still a little bit of questioning here as the audience about what is happening. So I was a little disappointed at the end when they really drove that home, right? When they really drove home that like she is 
doing this to herself and she is manipulating. And I, I just, I, I sort of wish this is, it, you know, it's not a big criticism, but I sort of wish they had just like left that, you know, inception moment where you're like, well, I don't know. It could be maybe. Well, I mean, I think, you know, part of, I think the um, Charlotte Rampling's abbess sister Felicita, you know, I think she's the one who says, okay, well, you know, if she cut herself or maybe it was the priest, if yeah. she cut herself, how do who who are we to say that God didn't lead her to do well, that, to demonstrate exactly. to us, right? I mean, I think that um But but I think seeing the the shard of pottery, like I I read that as like I hear what you're saying, mm -hmm. but I think that seeing the shard of pottery like really leans you into the like she is actually being manipulative. Because mm -hmm. you see, like there's so many things that happen at the end. You see the little bug on the the dude. Sorry, I'm so sorry. The nuncio. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And then you see her say like, oh, you're going to like the Jesus voice pops out of her and say you're going to die. But it's like, well, obviously you're saying that because oh, yeah. you you, she, he, you know that he has the plague, right? Like she starts yes. saying all of these things that she can force, right? She can say the plague's not going to come here because she told them to lock up the door, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you start to see that she is manipulating and making things up and holding, maintaining her power through these really like smart ways, right? She's being very- Yeah, but I guess like, I, I, I think like she's, I, I, I am absolutely- um, being generous with my reading and giving her the benefit <laughs> of the doubt and that I think Benedetta and I haven't read the book, but I am absolutely going to because this, <laughs> so this film is based on a book. Um, I don't know how loosely called immodest acts, the life of a lesbian nun in Renaissance Italy. And I'm like, put it in my veins. So I will be <laughs> checking out that book. Um, but it seems to me that Benedetta is so convinced that she is, that God is speaking through her, that she is God's chosen vessel, that the things that she does are thereby rationalized. So it's not as if she is doing these things purely out of malice um, or, you know, she truly believes that she has been um, like called to do these things. So any way in which she affects what God, she wants to do, she believes that's what God wants her to do, right? So I don't think it's as simple as her being like, hmm, I want to be the abbess because the abbess has got a bigger room, right? Wait. She certainly, you know, enjoys the freedom and the space and the power that it's offered her. But in her mind, God has chosen her. And so anything she does is then Wait, right, you know? I guess which is interesting too, because that is playing into this idea of like, you see her as a child, she's like, she's so bought in. She's mm -hmm. so bought into the faith that like, the, I, you know, I read it as the, the point being that she, like you can delude yourself, right? Like right. that you, you know, you, you're so bought into this that like, how can you believe someone at that point with, with mm -hmm. that level of faith in something? Um, but, uh, you know, at the same time, I mean, I guess what you're saying is that like, so now, even though it's against the church to be a lesbian or to ha or to have sex at all, um, that like it's OK because she's doing it because she's a chosen one. Yeah. She, you know, she says that scene with Bartolomeo and she says, you know, um, there's no shame under God's love. And I, I can see Benedetta rationalizing it to herself as in like the ecstasy that I am feeling that I am being led to in these moments of connection brings me closer to God, thereby mm -hmm. it is holy. You Speaking know? of ecstasy and good for her, mm -hmm. um, one is how the fuck does nobody in that convent hear her? <laughs> She's so Listen. fucking loud. Oh and, my two, gosh. and two, that dildo was the best thing I've ever seen. There's a shot of like when she, when um, Bartolomea is actually fucking her, there's a shot where you see Mary's head between her legs going in and out. And I was like, Okay, I know you're a creep and a perv, like directing this, but that shot was so fucking good. <laughs> I listen when when the abbess is explaining in the the court uh, the trial. Oh my exactly God. what yeah, she saw, yeah. and the like court stenographer is taking notes. <laughs> the look on his face when she explained, holy shit! You know, so so funny. There are some moments in this movie that are legitimately funny, mm -hmm. um, and. I was in a st in a studio. I was in a, um, a movie theater where no one but me and my friend laughed and we were surrounded <laughs> by what I what I assume are men and it was like it got really uncomfortable because we're like wait you're not really? laughing like this is fun. Yeah. Wait, are you are do you think this is serious? 
<laughs> you were really harsh in their vibe, Anita. They went in there to see I some lesbian today. Absolutely was. Oh my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. Yeah. <sighs> All right. What else? What else we got? What there's there's, we stuff, there's stuff that I want to talk about in the bonus. Okay. Um, Let's do that then. Well yeah. then. Okay, so. I don't know. I didn't like the movie. I thought it was exploitative in a way that felt really gross. Mm. But um, you periodically, know, it sounds like, it sounds like it, Carolyn and Ebony both like were you both were a little bit softer on it than I was to some degree. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think yeah. it's uh, so, it's yeah. something that you know I wouldn't go to the theater to see it. But um, if I was it's just available thinking on Amazon that. Prime. Check it out. I was just thinking that, Ebony. I was like, you watched it at home on a screener, and sure I did. dragged my ass to a fucking movie theater when I had no time to watch it. And I mm-hmm. wonder if mm-hmm. that just like made me. I better. know, I know, <laughs> and I understand because I dragged my feet getting a screener to you, but and I feel bad about it. But as I was watching this on my couch today, I was like, "Girl, you made the right decision." Yeah, you did. Yeah, um, I, I guess just my final thought, you know, here is again just to call back to something I said earlier, which is that you know I, I remember the uh, the extreme like condemnation around Martin Scorsese's The Last Temptation of Christ when that film Mm -hmm. came out, right? Because it was a film that humanized Jesus in a very specific way and by suggesting that he might experience, you know, sexual desire and temptation, right? Mm -hmm. And I just, again, like, while I don't think, you know, again, I don't love this film, but I I really think that when it comes to, you know, to to matters of faith and like and like exploring, I mean, where humanity and faith and like spirituality intersect to me, they're like I, I'm just so in favor of film uh, as a general principle, like giving us portrayals of, of people who who, you know, actually have to struggle with things that they feel or who feel things that they're quote unquote, not supposed to, or like, mm-hmm. like all human beings do. I mean, I, I don't know what could make faith more like sort of approachable and immediate and real and human than that. So, you know, yeah. in that sense, again, I, I, I appreciate that this film is part of what I would, of that tradition of films that, that piss off uh, certain, you know, sure. religious mm-hmm. people by venturing into that territory. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to make it clear. I I am a believer, you know, and I felt no uh, pr- problems with this movie, <laughs> you know. Um, I, so at the I same mean, time, can you can you speak for all Christians when you say absolutely, <laughs> absolutely? I can speak for all Christians who like to see a little boob every now and then, you know. Uh, no, I just you know want to say that, like it, to to Caro's point, that yes, I I loved that, you know, the sort of I love to see people wrestling mm. with these larger right. questions and sometimes making horrific <laughs> left-hand turns when they should go right, you know, but that is, you know, at its core, what it means to be human and to, to n- try and navigate mm-hmm. like the, the metaphysical reality, you know, of what it means to be us. So yeah, anyways, I definitely, if it's free on Amazon prime, I say, go for it. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, y'all. We'll be right back with some freakouts. You know, some days I am so stressed out and overwhelmed and like feel like a burden on everyone in my life and I just need somewhere to go. And that's why I'm really grateful that the Games Hotline exists. We started the Games and Online Harassment Hotline to support people who make and play games with all of the emotional support that they need. We specialize in issues around online harassment and gaming in general, but we're here for really anytime you're feeling heightened or stressed or just need someone to talk to. You know, we're confidential. We are anonymous. You only have to tell us what you want to tell us and nothing more. If you want to know more, check out gameshotline.org. Or if you want to get started right now, you can text support to 23368 anywhere in the U.S. and you'll be connected with an agent. That's gameshotline.org or text support to 23368. What's now it's time to talk about what's been thrilling us, moving us, upsetting us, or infuriating us this past week. Carolyn, what are you no. freaking out about? Uh, I'm freaking out about, um, so uh, my friend, the critic of uh, the film critic, Walter Cha, who was on 
this very podcast uh, to talk about Minari with us uh, once upon a time. Mm-hmm. Um, he has just done something that I think is really, really cool and that I really encourage people to check out if if they can. So on Netflix, uh, there's a new series of video essays called Voir, V-O-I-R. It's, um, I guess it's like produced or executive produced by David Fincher. You know, it has his name prominently featured on it. But anyway, it's a series of just individual video essays about film. And I think each one's like roughly 20, you know, 20 minutes long or so. And so, and you could just skip to, you know, I haven't watched all of them. Um, but, um, so, you know, you just skip to the ones that you're interested in or, or you watch all of them. But Walter- <laughs> Are those the uh, options, Carolyn? <laughs> yes, that's how it works. Um, but Walter contributed an essay uh, and I'm so thrilled that he got the opportunity to do this. And it's so good. His essay is on the film 48 Hours, the sort of buddy, yeah, not buddy, because there there's a lot of tension between them. That's the wrong word. But the the race comedy action drama, oh uh, 48 Hours, starring Nick Nolte and Eddie Murphy. In fact, it was Eddie Murphy's first screen performance. And really, you know, I mean, he, of course, done Saturday Night Live and stuff before. But it really, I think, put him on the map as like a screen star. And... um Walter's read on the film is such a fascinating and, you know, complicating perspective, right? I mean, he, what Walter does, I think I think a lot of people just sort of maybe dismiss that film as a, you know, as like a whatever. It's an action comedy. If it may, Maybe you find it entertaining. Maybe you just find it kind of problematic in some of its, you know, r- r- uh, way, some of the ways it engages with race, you know, whatever. But, he, you know, he really... Uh, and, uh, you know, I think whatever your thoughts on that film, or even if you haven't seen, I think you can watch the essay not having seen the film. But, you know, if you have a pre-existing notion of that film, I can almost guarantee that Walter will kind of complicate it, complicate what you think that film is or what you think of the um, the dynamic between the two leads in that film. And, you know, it's just it's um, it's just outstanding criticism and it's. Uh, you know, um, uh, anyway, I've, you know, grown to really admire Walter's work over the past few years as I've read him more and more. Now I've had the chance to meet him, uh, a few times and, uh, just think he's one of our most essential and vital film critics, you know, of this era. And so, yeah, I encourage people to check that out on, on Netflix. It's the final episode in the series, but again, because of how Netflix and episodes work, you can skip right to it and just watch that one if you want. <laughs> nice. That sounds awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ebony, what you got? I am freaking out about a book called Circe by Madeline Miller, uh, a book that Anita is currently reading right now. Yeah. So which I was am, which was recommended to me by Jay, our programs manager at Feminist Frequency. Just oh, shout out Jay. Yeah, um, you should reach out to Jay, and we should have a book club about it. Yeah, we really should, because I cannot tell you how much I loved this book. I was just overwhelmed by how masterfully it is written, um, how immersive it is. So Circe is the story of um, Circe of, from Greek mythology, who is the daughter of uh, one of the Titans. And, you know, through... <sighs> Just this, the labyrinthine politics, (laughs) you know, um, of the, the the court essentially of Greek gods and goddesses and, you know, the assorted powers winds up exiled to this um, isolated island and, you know, spends generations, hundreds, thousands of years, you know, sort of coming to terms with who she is, what her powers are, her difference, her desire, what makes her different from um, from humans, but also makes her different from, you know, the, the gods among whom she grew up. I'm not giving even one hundredth of a sense of how compelling this story is. I think I finished it in like a day because I just could not stop reading. It is propulsive. It is thrilling. It is horrifying. It is beautiful. Um, and I am seeing, like, I have the 
the author's webpage up right now, and it looks like they're going to be adapting it into a series on HBO Max, which I am both excited what? for and also really nervous for because yeah. it is it is a book that does not um, offer easy answers. Um, there are horrible things that happen that are not undone. Um, there is just such like heart wrenching pain. Um, and there's love and loss and, you know, finally understanding. And I just, I loved this book so, so, so much, so much that in fact, like, you know, sometimes Anita, you, you read something and it's so good. You don't want to pick up anything else for a little bit. Cause you know, it won't be as good, you know? And you're like, this is gonna make me feel bad about everything I read after this. I'm gonna have to give it like a <laughs> day or two before I pick up anything else. That's how much I loved, um, this book. So nice. Cersei by Madeline Miller. Loved it. I, so I, I am not having the same reaction you're having to it. Of course not. You and I, I never agree. That's not true at all. I've recommended some books that you really liked, Ebony. That is true. That I is know. true. But um, but it doesn't mean I'm not because it's interesting because you actually I thought I was like halfway through the book, but you your description stopped where I where I am at currently. So I'm really mm. curious what the like last half of the book and where that's going to go. Uh. Um, and, and because I, I, Jay gives me really great book recommendations. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, maybe I will come back with a freak out about my take on it. Yeah. 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 We'll see how that goes. Um, I am freaking out because I actually, we're recording this on Sunday, December 12th. And I just um, got back from the Walt Disney concert hall here in downtown LA, which is a beautiful, um, uh, a, a beautiful music hall that's like acoustically sound and all that kind of nonsense. Um, and I just watched a screening of Home Alone with a live orchestra and choir performance. Well, I'm sorry. The- I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What? Home Alone? Yes. So I did not know this, but Home Alone, um, which I only saw once as a child, like I do not have the warm fuzzies that a lot of people have about it. Sure. Christmas movies. Um, sure. It is a John Williams or like it is a John Williams score and the score is phenomenal. Um, and I was just like, this is some dumb kids movie from my childhood. But like, it's just it's gorgeous. And hearing it live in and like a, a the, a, the L.A. Philharmonic and then like after the intermission, there was a, a choir singing all of the choir part. It was just absolutely stunning. Um, mm. So like. And I know that lots of different towns do this where they'll like play live scores to movies that they're screening. And it's just, it's a really, um, I don't know. It's kind of an emotional kind of interesting experience. So I highly recommend it. Um, also, if you rewatch that movie, like listen to the score. Also listen to the score because it's Harry Potter. Like Harry Potter totally just ripped off the Home Alone mm-hmm. score. John Williams ripped off his own, wait, score? Yes. Right. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes. You know when it's you just would like, just like was, change the title of a paper that you turned in and yeah. then turn it in for another class? He, he's just like, this was so good. Why would I change You're it? Right. I'm just going to keep using this over and over again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, anyways, who knew? Who knew Home Alone? And also like, it's still kind of, it's kind of a cute movie. You know, it's it's fine. It holds up. <laughs> I mean, I do, I do like when Joe Pesci opens the door and gets his head burned. That's fun. You know, that's a oh. fun, funny, funny moment there. Yes. I was also thinking about um, who's the other, what's the name of the other actor? That's the other Daniel uh, Stern. Yeah. He's so good. Oh, he's great. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. I, great. I know. And I think we've talked about him and I was like, I don't know who you're talking about, but he's just like, his comedic timing is so good in this movie that yeah. I was like, good job, buddy. If you want to submit your own freakout, you can do that at feministfrequency.com slash freakout. That's F-R-E-Q-O-U-T. Thank you so much for listening to Feminist Frequency Radio. Carolyn, Yo. we're so happy to have you back. Do you want to really shout were. out anything you're working on, your social media, where you can know. people find you yeah. if they're new to the podcast? Sure, sure. I mean, just the best place to find you know, find me is to follow me probably on Twitter at Carolyn Michelle, C-A-R-O-L-Y-N Michelle. I feel like I need to spell Carolyn out because every time I go to a coffee shop and I say my name is Carolyn, they always, always write Caroline. And my name is not Caroline. I know. And we actually have listeners who write in and call Uh you Carol. And we're like, no, no, it's Caro. C-A-R-O. Caro for short. (laughs) You know, Carolyn or Caro, not Carol. 
yeah. uh, and not Caroline. So please follow me on Twitter. And, you know, I share uh, all random thoughts about movies, about video games, links to uh, articles uh, that we publish on Kotaku that I think are valuable and interesting um, or just goofy and fun. Um, yeah. So uh, that's probably the best thing to do if you want more Caro in your life. Always want more Caro in my life. Yeah. Aww. Um, this is the last episode of the season and of the year. So thank you for joining us for this whole year. Um, I feel like we have just totally dropped the ball on video games. Yeah. Um, so in the new year, I'm going to start. We're, we're thinking about bringing back some gaming content. Yes. Uh, onto it. the podcast. Do it. <laughs> we might have you back on Carolyn to do some of that with I us occasionally. It. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, if you if you are all missing some gaming stuff, we're going to we're going to do some of that. Um, and yeah, so, you know, stay stay tuned. Uh, the Star Trek Discovery season four podcast is running and will be running through the rest of the year into the new year. So if you you know, miss me. I'll, that's where I will be. <laughs> um, but other than that, we'll see you in the new year. Right on. Our show is engineered by Rob Perra. Carrie Stimson provides technical support, artwork by Jamie Varon, and our intro music is by Phil Circus. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye, folks. Bye.